thermodynamics. And to start talking about thermodynamics, we really got to go for the, through the first three laws of thermodynamics. So what's the first law of thermodynamics? It's about energy, and energy is what? Conserved. Conserved. What's another way of phrasing that? can't be created or destroyed. What does this mean? So, so he, energy can be transferred from one form to another and stuff like that, but it can't be created or destroyed. So if we look at the universe, or even if we go smaller, let's say we look at a closed system. Let's say we closed all the doors, blocked all the vents in the room, and insulated this as good as you could ever insulate something. Provided it was perfectly insulated, the amount of energy in this room today, bless you, would be the amount of energy in the room tomorrow. It wouldn't change. That's what we mean by energy is conserved. The amount of energy in a closed system doesn't change, or at least the amount of energy in the universe, per se, doesn't change. So what's the second law? And the second law, you should know these by number, by the way. Which one's the first law? Which one's the second law? Which one's the third? The second law is probably the most likely one for you to see a question on, by the way. So you definitely want to know the second law. So the second law starts off for what? For a spontaneous process. So, and what's true about a spontaneous process? The entropy of the universe does what? Goes up, which means increases. So, little reminder, what is entropy, by the way? Randomness or disorder. At least that's how we conceptually think about it. Truth be told, entropy actually has a mathematical definition. It's the amount of heat transferred divided by the temperature at which it's transferred. Q over T, oddly enough. Ever hear it presented like that? Well, truth be told, that's the mathematical definition. If you take PCHEM later on, that's what we'll give you. But somehow that really translates conceptually into randomness or disorder. And for any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe is going to go up. So we used to have a PCHEM professor and uh, his eight-year-old boy at the time. He told his eight-year-old boy to clean his room, and he's one of those professors that like, teaches his kid calculus when he's like six and all that stuff and starts showing him stuff. So at eight years old, he told his son to you know, clean his room, and he says, but dad, if I cleaned my room, that would be a spontaneous process because it happened, at least with all the stuff I do, and that would actually increase the amount of disorder in the universe. So by cleaning my room, I'd actually be dirtying the universe. Is that what you really want me to do? Or something along those lines at eight. So. Needless to say, don't torture your kids, right? So a couple of different ways to phrase the second law of thermodynamics. And you should know every possible way. But every single way it's phrased, it always starts off for a spontaneous process. So in this case, the other way to say it is that for a spontaneous process, if the entropy of the universe goes up, if it increases, that means the change in the entropy of the universe is? Yeah, positive. Same thing, increasing means a positive change. So another way to phrase the same thing. And we can take this one more way for a spontaneous process. So it turns out there are two things in the universe, and only two. And if you've ever been in love, you know this. There's two things in the universe, the person you're in love with and everything else, right? So in chemistry, we kind of look at the same thing. There's two things in the universe, what you're looking at and everything else. And what you're looking at is called the system, and everything else is the surrounding. So another way to say the second law of thermodynamics is to say, for a spontaneous process, the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings is positive. Cool. Now, truth be told, by setting this is for a spontaneous process, if you guys had to learn about a reversible reaction, well, a reversible reaction is carried out at equilibrium. And for that one case, it's not really spontaneous, it's at equilibrium, that's when delta S of the universe actually equals zero. But for anything that's actually spontaneous, not reversible, so delta S of the universe will be a positive number. Always increases the entropy in the universe. Notice system and surroundings. So when I give you the delta S of a reaction, I am only giving you the delta S of the system. That's all I'm giving you. Can the delta S of just the system 
be negative. Yeah, for sure. Delta S of a reaction can totally be negative. But let's say I told you that the delta S of the system was negative 100 kilojoules. What would you know about the delta? Let's say 100 joules, actually. Negative 100 joules. What would you know about the delta S of the surroundings? It's bigger than positive 100. That way, when you add them together, it comes out positive. So a lot of students mix this up just a little bit, and they think, oh, delta S of a reaction can't be negative because of a second law of thermodynamics. That's not true, because the reaction is just the system, not the entire universe. Question? For a reversible process, delta S will equal zero for, for the universe, but only for reversible. And a reversible process is one that's carried out at equilibrium. And we're not going to go into it too much because it's not so important for your class. But when we start talking about a spontaneous process, that's not reversible at this point. That's irreversible to be a spontaneous process. And for that, the delta S of the universe will indeed be positive, not zero. Cool. Last one, third law of thermodynamics. This one's not so important, but you know, not as important as number two anyways. And when I say not as important, it means that you're just not as likely to get a question on it. Does that mean you'll never get a question on it? Not at all. So you should definitely know all three, but I'm just saying bang for your buck, number two is most likely. But what is the third law of thermodynamics? So it talks about the entropy of a perfect crystal. So it turns out there's one time where we can know the exact entropy by, you know, it's kind of a reference state, of the exact entropy of a perfect crystal. By perfect, I mean no impurities. So, and there's a little more to it than that, but for now, we'll say it means it's pure. So, and when will I know the entropy? At zero Kelvin, the lowest possible temperature. So, and the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero. Turns out you can't have less entropy than when you have a perfect crystal cooled all the way down to zero. And if you can't have less than that point, then we'll call that point zero, because you can't ever get lower. So turns out that as you cool down a sample, what happens to the atoms and molecules in that sample as you cool it down? They slow down. So what it turns out, when you cool it all the way down to zero, Turns out, you're actually not going to get them to completely stop, it turns out. But that's as slow as they're ever going to get, and they're vibrating anyways. So they'll vibrate just a teeny tiny bit at that low temperature even. So but since you can't get any lower entropy than that, that's what we call zero. So by definition, third law of thermodynamics, perfect crystal at zero Kelvin has no entropy. Cool. Any questions on the three laws? You really just need to memorize them.